Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gary Banks. I'm going to start us off on the wireless talk here, but basically we also have along with us uh, David Whelan and Mitch Davis. I'm going to break it up into three uh, quick components. Let me make sure I click the right button here. Thought I could. Anyway, not advanced. My fault. Ah. Uh, break it down into three parts. I'm going to start off with uh, what I would call a, a basic vanilla version of a wireless installation, nothing too sexy or really cool. Uh, it's kind of a, a Walmart approach to wireless at the University of Virginia School of Law. And um, as we move along, we'll move into then, okay, you've got wireless, wireless services with your notebook and your data, as well as potentially cell phones, PDAs, and pagers that have been around. We're familiar with those wireless services. But then, okay, what about it? Now you've got wireless and we'll take a look at some security issues and then we'll move on into some, uh, okay, well now what are you doing with wireless now that wireless is everywhere and, and you're using wireless services in your law school? So let me take a look. And which button did I hit that made it go? Got it. So I'll go ahead and get my part going. Wireless version one. That's that's the way I kind of think of where we have. I'm going to just quickly go over, you know, why we get pushed, or when was the opportunity, the business plan that got us into wiring, uh, doing wireless. And I'll tell you, we'll very quickly run up how we got into it, and uh, the kinds of advantages and, and different ways of thinking about law school life uh, that wireless have presented to us. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Why did we start wireless? This is just two years ago. We don't, you know, lost University of Virginia Law School, 1,100 students. Uh, we have a couple of buildings I'll show you. But, you know, 20 classrooms. I mean, it, we have enough people, enough. It's not too small a school, not super large. Um, only had a couple of classrooms that had any kind of technology in it, if you will. And that was just even two years ago. So we're taking a look at we need to provide more technology at, at lectern kinds of issues. And I'm not having, there we go. And when I was taking a look at upgrading them, I had one good location to upgrade a classroom in the sense that I had a four 64-person classrooms so that were designed for our small sections. And they happened to be located or situated in a pod. They were all, and they had one room right in the middle. So that was a nice room to start to upgrade because it was a good class size. That there was two first-year sections for us. They were very popular sized rooms. And having that one room in the middle was, was a good place for me to start to upgrade my next four classrooms. But I only had, I had one problem in the sense that it was on a second floor concrete slab and I didn't have enough conduit to get to the lectern where the professor would be. I was short one. So we just took a look at using wireless as a solution to provide the data connection for the, the uh, lectern and the computer that would be there. That saved me having to do architectural fees and $60,000 core drilling through the, uh, the concrete slab. So there was a very easy and uh, to explain reason why we wanted to do wireless in these four classrooms could move right along and I didn't have to do a major construction project. So there was, sorry, go forward. So it basically solved the problem. It wasn't controversial. I didn't necessarily have a great, I have a dream or a vision or epiphany that said, you know, wireless is the reason to go. It was going to give me the business case why to go ahead and jump into it. What I did get out of that first year was just basically taking a look at the access points. They were small, they were convenient. Uh, we got to look at the players, the throughput, test it out. And I was only really having to support four computers in the classrooms. I wasn't supporting the students. Uh, it was just one location, one access point, but it really got us into understanding what's involved. I could then project what the cost would be, you know, what was the downtime on the access point, what do we need to do to manage it if this was actually deployed full scale. And it was very easy to get, based on numbers, what we needed to do. Nothing scared us. <laughs> perhaps foolishly, I don't know, but we took a look at it and we made a commitment to provide a wireless service for the students throughout the entire law grounds. There was really no reason to limit it to just potentially classrooms or to libraries or student organization spaces or where they might habitat. It was The idea is you make it ubiquitous. You just make it everywhere. You don't try to define policies in restricted uh, use areas. Maybe the battery's going low. <laughs> um, and the only goal for it, why, why did we want to do it? It wasn't to be really cool. It wasn't as part of an admissions brochure. It wasn't part of a you know, welcome to a really cool world. 
it was just going to be to solve the basic communication problem that occurs in both the academic as well as the non-academic life of students. I mean, and whether that was writing home to mom or it was doing something in the class for the class, that, that was fine. The idea was just basic communications everywhere. Let's go for it. Okay, how do we go for it? This was a, year, a little over a year now, though. We all go through two parts of this. On the network side, what do we do? And then what do we do? How do we decide to support the clients and get the students up and running? Um, basically, let me go ahead and show you the numbers. But uh, the law school's interior uh, space is about 300,000 square feet. Um, we actually ended up covering 4,000 feet of uh, what I call interior garden space. Let me see if I can switch here. Come on, Gary. Oh, wrong key. Um, this is just an aerial view to show you that you know, we've got the one building here, and then there's a building connecting the two, and then this other building over here. So it's a, it's a brick structure, concrete frame with everything hung off. We ended up covering this interior 40,000 square feet just because, and remember, wireless just goes through. There's no limitations on the space. Uh, and it's, well, you can call it multi-story. It's only three stories. It's not, your, it's not a major metropolitan school. It might have 10 to 15 stories with you know, large uh, elevator shafts and considerations. So this is actually, I would think, a very simple building that, as I can envision what other schools would have to deal with uh, as far as how to put the access points and deploy them. Let me come back. Sorry. Skip. Yeah, yeah. Ah, <laughs> oh, okay. Come on. Concrete and steel. Um, the thing that was fun for me and took me a while to get my head around is it, you've got to remember it's, it's three-dimensional. I mean, it's not just an access point that sits here with the two little antennas and you're necessarily covering here. You're, you're covering above, you're covering below, and you have fun issues with channels and overlapping frequencies and the density of going through this particular wall and all that. So, I mean, that was a fun component of laying it out. Um, to be honest, I didn't do it. I just got to watch uh, George Payne and uh, the student assistant that we had do the site survey and whatnot. But I, I, I was sympathetic with them. <laughs> yeah, I do the classic, I have a vision, and then I, I say make it so. It's, it's, a, it's a really nice thing to go for. Come on. Um, to cover that whole space, because it's a fairly simple structure, I, I'm imagining again, I, I just use $1,000 for an access point, so I can tell you it's $18,000 for the access points. Um, plus we had to... Uh, pay some of our UVA facilities because at the time, this is not as much an issue anymore with the newer access points, some locations and ceilings and whatnot you had to provide power and so there was some electrical work that we had to do for a few points. Uh, but as much as possible, you know, we simply ran conduit up an existing wall outlet to provide the connection for the access point uh, and we would run it right into the duplex, existing duplex power outlet. So this was a re you know, retrofit with an existing uh, facility. Uh, as I say, the site survey and all the installation, that was a student assistant who was a third year spring student uh, who was very bright on law review and uh, seemed to have plenty of time to do other activities, um, but was a Nobel certified engineer, I mean a geek, I mean had been trained, so I, I don't want to downplay it, and he was very enthusiastic and, and his legacy still survives and whatnot, but it, again, think pan to it, uh, you know, little boxes to protect it, this was a, a Home Depot installation. Um, but the point was I was going for the service. And what I would say is doing it all this way, that having the service uh, as, the, as the current commercial does is actually priceless because the return on investment, and that's what we're going to see what I'm getting already, even off a of basic install, much less as we go through the next two presenters. It, 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 gets, it gets to be very fun. Click. On the client side, um, having not done it before, in this case, I actually didn't just tell somebody to go make it, so I actually got my hands involved in, in doing it. Uh, we worked up a little wall school computer bundle with our UVA wholly owned subsidiary bookstore and whatnot. Um, but it really was just a convenience bundle. I mean, the first time we put it out, it was if you want to do wireless, you have to buy it. 
I'm trying to tell you where I am now after having been through one year, which is this year's income in class, it's out there for comparison shopping. It's not any better at Dell necessarily. Uh, the wireless card's not actually even installed. Uh, it's not configured with any law school image. It's just a Dell that's a basic notebook. Um, and it's a good place to start. And if, it, if the student desert, you know, decides that's convenience to have a vendor that's actually in Charlottesville and they you know, recognize them as a UVA student, that's the student's choice. So I'm not requiring them to buy a model. I'm not requiring them to buy a new model. I'm just saying here's a good starting point. As you know, I also say the wireless card's optional. They don't, they don't have to buy it. They don't have to have it on day one when they arrive. They can, they can buy it when they want to do it in October. I'm not, I'm not going to make them do it. What we do, and what we're going to do again, is we conduct these workshop tryout sessions. And I say it's a tryout in the sense that you know, they can come in and look me in the face and see it work and decide not to buy it. That, that's fine. But they'll know it works. I thought I'd quickly go through you know, just what the nature of a workshop is. Most of the stuff's up on our website. But up front, well, you know, it's the basic sign up. I make you confirm to a particular session. Uh, we vary the days and times, and basically we commit to getting everybody a shot at one session. Um, I do it in an hour time period just because get, we get tired. Uh, we can only do it for an hour or so at a time. But we have 330 incoming students, and we simply advertise at the beginning of the time, you know, here's, here's the schedule, We're gonna, you sign up, and we take them for one hour. And the, what our throughput is, is we do it in 15 minute time blocks. And we have eight students. So, you know, three to 315, eight students are confirmed to sign up and come on into room 253. And what we do, i got to get out of this. Uh, I have two techies, and one of them is myself. This I actually was working, and then George Payne. And what we do is each one of us has just two wireless cards, and they're Cisco 350s for this upcoming year. They're the one card we do specify if we're going to do wireless. We, you know, this is the card we know the most about. And you can sit eight students right here. You give them a card, give them a card. Uh, and most of the time, it's insert the card, and they're just saying, what do I do? Click yes, click yes, and that's it. They're on site, the access point. They get self-configured. And you know, most of the time, it's just watching it, and they feel comfortable. And if they get asked an oddball question, or you know how Windows will always say, please tell me where the CAB files are. And it's like, well, you know, here it is. And sometimes when you install a particular version of the operating system, we'll lose track of where the Cisco drivers were on the CD. Um, or you want to make sure they don't install the driver that they think that the hard drive, they think they have already on the hard drive. You want to make sure they're actually installing the driver cleanly from the, the version of the software that we have. So that's how we get the two people, you know, and that means basically seven and a half minutes to get two people done. And that's how we schedule the workout. The 10 minute best effort's a little bit worth it. Somebody's going to have some system that's not going to work. I mean, you know, the, the worst case we had was I, I had a Windows 95 Korean made. It was an, a, a foreign born student, and it was a Korean made Korean OS for Windows 95. And he didn't have the CD ROM, didn't have the disks to reinstall if it crashed. And, you know, I, I strongly suggested that he actually not do this. He was only going to be there for one year and whatnot, but he went ahead and did it. So you need to be able to, on those cases, you escalate the problem when it's not going to go just as smoothly as smoothly as you think, and you catch them on the back. So the, the, it's a cattle call at the beginning of the term to get as many people as fast and quickly up and running as you want. All I'm asking is that when they walk out of there, the drivers are already installed, they know with absolute confidence it works with their notebook. Again, they could have brought an existing two-year-old notebook that's reliable and they feel very comfortable with it was a compact. But at that point, they have a guaranteed service that this card's gonna work. And that's all I'm telling them to do. They can buy the card at that point from PC connection or micro warehouse, I don't care. As long as it's the Cisco 350 if they wanna to talk to me about it. So we get into the fun stuff. Keep moving along. That's on the computing support. It's important to remember that wireless here is really only part of our computing environment. And there's a lot of advantages, at the, in particular, I think, with the University of Virginia that would need to be noted. Uh, we're on what they call the North Grounds, um, meaning you saw the facility. It's a kind of enclosed facility. Uh, most law students, we don't have a, we don't have a part-time program. We don't have a night program. Our uh, LLM students, you know, coming from um, other countries is typically only 50 students, so that we're not large there. We do have JD MBAs, but it's on the 20 side, so it's not too large a scale there. 
Um, we do require notebook ownership, so everybody's coming with a notebook. Uh, and we do do all our exams on site. So, you know, there's a whole bundle of, in, on our intranet, there's career services. You know, the exams are submitted that way. The schedules are up there, student photos. There's a huge bunch of reasons why having a notebook with wireless might be attractive to a student. Um, this one I'm tracking, it, it seems, and I think when you get to the end of the presentation, you, it's easier to wrap this one up. There's a little bit less reliance on their home ISP in the sense of, you know, whether it's uh, AOL or whatever. When you have wireless and you can get to it anytime, anywhere when you're in high speed and you're at the law school, you don't do it as much as home because it's slow, unless you have DSL or, you know, a cable modem. Uh, so that my speech and the welcoming part about, oh, and you need to get AOL or mine, that, that's not quite as, as, as true now that wireless is everywhere for everybody. This is, this, is Gary's, this is Gary's direction. We'll see if I can direct it. Uh, less reliance on uh, providing desktop computers in a traditional lab setting. Or what I'm trying to say there is, when I, my vision is, if you have a notebook, which all our students are required to have, and I provide enough wireless services, I can reduce the amount of desktop PCs that I have to provide for general computing. The idea is just, let's start to put my money more into providing reliable wireless services everywhere, rather than buying a bunch of desktop PCs all the time to keep up. Um, easier support when computer crashes. If you have a wireless card and you have a place where they can store network, you know, their files on the network, it's a bad thing when they spill coffee. But if they've done a little bit of their backing up to the network and they've got a wireless card, which makes it easier to always be backing up to the network, you actually have a better, quicker remedy in the sense that their data, their information is not lost. It's still money out of pocket. It's still a tragedy, but the data's not gone. Um, I've been talking mostly in terms of students. That's where my focus has been. Indirectly, this benefits faculty as well. My incoming faculty, I've been saying congratulations, welcome aboard. They're getting notebooks with the port replicators with the wireless card. And of course, then they go home and they're going to try to do wireless at home as well. Um, let me move through. We can bring these up if they come up in questions and answers, but I don't want to shortchange my colleagues. We get the card, you know, what about the only card? Do you support other cards? I won't go through the answers. Uh, what about finals? We have a session on exams tomorrow, but basically the answer there is, you know, the professor can set their own rules about whether cut and pasting is allowed. I mean, you get into honor issues and stuff. But that's a really short answer to a long question. Uh, what's the reaction from the students? Obviously, they like it. They think it's cool. Faculty uh, so far haven't really cared you know, on a daily basis about the wireless because they, they have the, the, they're still entrenched with their desktops. I mean, there's not, we haven't had enough purchasing cycles go by where they would really care whether they were using wireless. And we still have PCs in the classrooms, so there's not the advantage of just walking down with your notebooks and stuff like that, foreshadowing. Uh, surfing class, I mean, you know, people did crosswords, people do. Uh, any other number of activities that they're not paying attention to, that's an etiquette issue. Uh, the only thing that obviously gets to be new that's unique to having web access, wireless, is if it's a multi-user game and you laugh and you laugh at the same time, it's a little bit <laughs> more disconcerting. But again, the professor needs to be apprised of it. And, you, and just as always has been the case, they need to know how to deal with it or not and set the expectations up front about what code of conduct is. Come on. Other activities. Uh, this is fun. You know, we're talking about uh, the last six years has always been building new buildings. Building use changes. When wireless is everywhere and they all have notebooks, because we have a requirement again for notebooks, they will define their own local neighborhoods. You may build this place and call it a coffee bar. They may use it as a study space during the exam period. It'll be a locally defined variable, different, different parts of the day. It could be a quiet study space. It could be a kind of casual group study space or whatever because they're no longer tethered to having a certain location that's a work study room. They'll sit down sometimes. We notice we didn't like it from a building point of view. When they have 10 minutes before class, they'll just pop right down outside the class and do the casual email reading. That's noisy. I mean, can you imagine if 50 kids were out here doing, you know, kind of white browsing, reading CNN, SI and stuff, and they're doing it right out here. Um, we've built rooms that we thought would be the periodical kind of browsing room. It's the quiet space because they can define it that way. 
So it really becomes very, your building use patterns change and they change year to year. That's interesting. And let's see. The time slicing, that's just basically these guys, I mean, the men and women now, right? I mean, it's, there's the Washington Post. Here I'm in the class. Here's an email. Now I'm paying attention. I mean, they're in and out, in and out. And their expectancy of what it'll take for you to reply to them, they, they expect it right now. All of a sudden, career services can send a note out that a new employer is coming along. You know, scan yeah, arts. Boom! You know what I mean? And you're like, wait, you're in class. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's you got to look for it. Um, when you have wireless and notebooks everywhere, you start to integrate. All these things are no longer a, a separate project or cost or a way to support it. If all your student photos are online, your help desk and reference desk is online and secured and tracked, and your course materials, course web pages, and you've got this single sign-on going in with a, an extensive extranet, all of a sudden it's the same user interface. Every new application you roll out is no big deal. What have you done for me lately? Because they don't have to go to the lab. They can do it anywhere, at any time, at 3 in the morning, because I work at 5 p.m. It's no longer a big deal. Okay, let me get out of here. Uh, so far, I haven't hired anybody new as, uh, as a result directly of the wireless. Uh, the access points, clients all work. That's pretty straightforward. We haven't had any significant problems there. Manage expectations up front. That's nothing that's always with your techie. What, what do you expect the student to do? What do you expect my service to be for you? Um, keep remembering, telling them technology is a support tool. You don't go out there leading with wireless. You don't, well, I don't go out there leading. Sorry. I'll skip that. <laughs> that's a marketing issue. Um, bottom line, I think it's important to say, you know, once you get into wireless and you understand it, okay, where are we going with it now? What are the issues you need to keep in mind as you move forward? Because just having the wireless and whatnot now is very, very doable. It's just a matter of you know thinking about how you're going to use it and committing to then providing more and more attractive wireless services. Um, so I think it's amazingly painless and very exciting thing to begin. And I'll stop that and hand it off. My name is David Whelan. I'm the uh, director of the ABA's Legal Technology Resource Center, and uh, we provide technology support to lawyers. Lawyers can just call us up and ask us any question, and, uh, and we do our best to try and answer it uh, with good information. Um, we also try and provide support on technology issues that relate to the practice, like uh, UCEDA, Universal Citation, and things like that. Um, I'm going to just gloss over a couple of issues today uh, relating to wireless, I and mean, there are a ton of things that we could be talking about. Um, Mitch has got something really cool that he's going to show you, so I'm going to give you a, just sort of a heads up on a couple of topics, uh, including security, uh, and then we'll go from there. Let's see if I can get this to work. Wireless in law schools is being adopted uh, more and more by universities across the country. There are 35 law schools at least who are using it now. Uh, I did a survey of, of 160 IT directors uh, and other people at law schools last month. 79 respondents, 35 are using wireless either in their law library or in law schools. Uh, and another 21 are planning to buy technology in the next 12 months. So there's a, a pretty good adoption uh, th through the law school community. We're also seeing, as uh, Gary's mentioned, it's tricky, isn't it, Gary? <laughs> uh, that students are coming with wireless to the law schools. They're not necessarily getting it just when they get there. They may have it from their employer. They may have it at their home. Um, it's becoming more ubiquitous outside the law school experience. And so it's easy to expect it to become, uh, with students coming with expectations about what their wireless access will be when they get there. So now that you've got wireless, now what? You know, or maybe so what? Uh, three topics. Security is rep enough. Bluetooth and 802.11b high rate uh, and possible conflicts that you might run into there. And then 802.11a, uh, what I think is the future of wireless lands and is probably going to be coming along quickly. Uh, again, in our survey, most of the people who had wireless networks uh, in law schools had had them for a year or less, um, probably 75%. That's just a, a, an estimate based on my recollection of the numbers. Uh, but most had them for a very short time, so I don't think anybody's necessarily looking for a refresh on their equipment. But 802.11a will be coming down the pike, and, and that will be something to think about. With wireless networks, uh, 
you've got some evasiveness, uh, ability to uh, avoid network sniffing merely by the fact that it, use, it uses spread spectrum, but you don't want to rely on that uh, as a security uh, method for your network. You also may have the ability to configure your access points with the MAC addresses for your network cards. Each card will have a particular address that you can use, uh, and these are just basic things that you'll want to start using on your wireless network to stop people who don't have MAC addresses that can work on your network uh, from getting into your network. With the new interoperability, if I go to Gary's uh, law school with a Lucent card and I want to get onto his Cisco network, I can do so now. Um, and so you'll be in the position of having to make sure that your network is secured against people who might just walk onto campus or are sitting out in the grounds and uh, enjoying your network access. Wire equivalent privacy uh, is probably not enough security for your network. Uh, and it really was meant to only bring your wireless network up to the equivalent of an unencrypted wired network. Uh, you'll need to use the same level of security concern that you have for your wired network with your wireless. For interoperability under the Wi-Fi trademarked uh, interoperability standards, you only need to have 40-bit encryption. There are products now that come out with much higher levels of encryption, and you should probably think about going to one of them as you do upgrades in the future. Uh, Cisco, for example, the 350 card that Gary's using uh, has a 120-bit encryption, as well as a, another security uh, layer on top of that. Um, so again, wireless equivalent privacy is just sort of the very bare bones. If you're, if you're not doing anything else, it's something worth doing. There's a proposal being made to, uh, and I always get the E's wrong, but it's the Institute for Electronics and Electrical Engineers, if I've got it right, um, made by Cisco and Microsoft and some other vendors to try and plug the security holes in the wireless standard for high rate. And uh, you may have heard about the report that came out in February from some scientists who found the, the security holes in the wireless standard. Um, there weren't new holes. What I've read uh, as far as the history of the standard goes is that uh, the people who were developing the standard just didn't know a whole lot about implementing security on a network. Uh, and so there are holes there, but they were at some level known. Um, so this standard, which they're calling 802.1x, uh, is meant to fill that, fill that space and bring the level of security for that standard up. In the meantime, vendors are beginning to implement proprietary security encryption on their uh, cards. The 350 from Cisco is one of them, uh, so that people who want to buy a higher level of security can, can get it without having to just rely on the web security that comes with the standard. Um, one of the pr problems with that is that it's almost taking a step back to where we were before the standards, because if you don't have the Cisco 350 card or the Cisco 340 upgraded, uh, and the highest level of security is implemented with that card, I can't walk on again with my Lucent card, and you may need to be in the position of having all of your equipment and your students' uh, cards uh, from the same vendor. So my recommendations, for what they're worth, uh, if you're not doing anything else, use MAC restrictions. It's unwieldy, but at least it's, it's a basic level of restriction on your wireless network. It's unwieldy because you need to take all of the MAC addresses for your wireless cards, and there will be some ability to configure your access point to put the, that, those MAC addresses in there, and that will then stop wireless cards without those MAC addresses accessing through that access point. Next level up, it may sound surprising, but some people have web security on their wireless network and don't turn it on. Um, turn it on. Uh, you'll have at least a 40-bit uh, security there. If you've bought higher security, then of course you can take advantage of that. And then the other two suggestions, if, uh, if you're buying new, uh, either doing an upgrade uh, soon or buying just brand new, uh, you're one of those people who is, is going to be upgrading in the next 12 months, consider buying uh, a vendor product that has the uh, additional security on it or uh, install virtual private networking uh, support, a radius server, and uh, start doing remote authentication for the users on your wireless network. Just a brief overview on standards, now jumping to the Bluetooth and the high rate issue. Uh, 802.11a and 802.11b are the two wireless LAN standards. Um, 802.11b will be what the products uh, people in this room are going to be using for the most part. Uh, Bluetooth is the other one that you hear a lot about. It's also a 2.4 gigahertz wireless network. Uh, it has a, a smaller range, 30 feet, and it goes slower than the 802.11b wireless networks. And it's really focused on home and personal, personal area networks, hands and pans. And then Hyperland, which I'm not going to talk about, but it is something that if you're uh, into wireless, 
or looking at wireless, uh, allows you to have both an Ethernet and an ATM network using wireless. But the real issue is going to be Bluetooth and high rate because both of them operate in the same segment of the radio spectrum, and so you may run into collisions. The real issue will only be if you are thinking about putting in Bluetooth networks and access points so that you're, you have access points for Bluetooth and you've got access points for your high rate and they're too close together and you begin to have data collisions. From what I can tell, you, uh, I'm sorry, jumping ahead, uh, there is another work group from IEEE, the 80215 work group, which is working on a uh, standard that will allow Bluetooth and the 80211B standards to coexist so that uh, there won't be the, these kinds of conflicts in the future. The Wireless Line Alliance, it's a vendor group, uh, has research conflicts and has a good white paper on their website uh, that talks about how to configure the, the kinds of distance you need to keep between the access points so that you don't have the conflicts. And this may not matter if you've just got users who are creating ad hoc networks on their own. Mitch and Gary and I walk into a room and we've all got Bluetooth devices that are just talking to each other, but we're not actually going through an access point. Uh, that may not have the same kind of effect as if there's an access point uh, for a Bluetooth and an access point for an 802.11b uh, network. And then fi finally, the wireless feature, uh, 802.11a, it's faster. Five gigahertz range is still an obstacle. Unlike the 2.4 gigahertz range, it's not available all over the world. And so uh, there is still some vendor reluctance to uh, creating products there. Uh, it supports higher speeds. The standard uh, indicates 54 megabits per second. Um, one uh, article indicated that he thought it would only make, to, make it to 40, but uh, we'll see when it actually comes out. Um, and products are expected at the end of this year. Cisco has bought one of the people who is producing the chips. Atheros uh, has another one that they've got, and uh, Proxim has just signed on as a partner for theirs. Uh, 72 megabits per second for their product, and uh, compliance with 802.11a up to 54 megabits per second. So in the next 12 months, if you're buying or upgrading or, or later than that, you should probably keep an eye out for these 802.11a products. If you've got a, an 802.11b product right now and you're not doing anything that requires the additional uh, bandwidth, you probably don't need to make any kind of jump. But if you're thinking about streaming video or higher uh, use of your network, this may be a product you want to go for. And also think about handheld computing and other devices that are going to be using wireless. And uh, Mitch is going to talk more about that. Um, but you're starting to see handhelds like the Handspring come out with uh, wireless uh, network cards. Uh, people will be using things other than laptops and desktops in the future uh, for wireless networking. <coughs> All yours. Hi, my name is Mitch Davis. I'm the CIO for Stanford Law School. I'm going to talk today about what we've done with wireless technology and uh, how we've been running. We've been running it about, since 1998, we had a whole Nokia, oh, here we go, wait a second. How do you turn this thing on? Hang on. Hang on. Great. We've been running it about since 1998 and we've started with a uh, installation of Nokia and 25 access cards, 25 access, let's try again, yeah. 25 access points, and we had minimal success with that, students liked it, we couldn't do any uh, audiovisual stuff with it, the access was okay, the access points didn't reach as far as the new 802.11b we installed about six months ago. Um, we moved on then to uh, uh, Nearspace and the Palm Project, is the next thing I'll talk about, then I'll go into our content transformation engine. I'll just move right into that. Uh, we went pack bell DSL to the homes of the faculty with uh, Nokia at first. We had probably three faculty who participated in that uh, function. Uh, we installed one access point and uh, uh, networked their houses because prior to that, we were using networking in the faculty homes. I go home, try to use that. It, we couldn't get anybody in the valley to actually install networking in the homes. We'd, we'd schedule it. The DSL would take five months to get installed, and then to get the network again would take another two months. We started with access points. At least we got the DSL in, and then we could go ahead and get the access points in. The faculty thought it was great. They could take the laptop home, use it on the network, take it back to the law school, use it in the office. Then all we wanted to do was increase the speeds. So we went ahead and up upgraded the speed 
Uh, recently, we then worked with the students. We found that students weren't doing it because these are, said the cards were expensive. And we couldn't get a group, a large, large enough group of students to go ahead and use the network, so we contacted Airwave. Airwave was a company that went ahead and was networking all of Palo Alto, San Jose, San Francisco, at various locations with 802.11b. So we brought them over to the law school, showed them what we were trying to do, and so we had a great group of people that could probably tell them where they needed to put those access points. So they went ahead and we had a drawing, and uh, we gave out 75 access cards, as long as the students participated in a focus group as to where they were going, and they had to get back to Airwaves to tell them, oh, I'm over at Starbucks, or I'm over here, or I'm over there. And they went ahead and went over to Starbucks and said, you guys should install an access point because we have all these people that need access there. And that project went really well, and the students then started buying the cards. They started seeing value there. And then we started a Westlaw Palm wireless project. We were looking at, okay, there's this device. What are you going to do with it? We have, we have uh, according to our admissions, 60% of the students were arriving with these palms. And we wanted to know, okay, if they're arriving, what are they doing with them? So we talked to Westlaw. Westlaw was developing an application for uh, using Westlaw on the palm. And we said, well, look, let's get a group of students together, create a focus group, and we'll use three months at the law school. We'll teach them how to use it. They're spending three months at the law firms, and we're going to come back and do a questionnaire, find out what they're doing with those wireless palms, and if it's a valuable resource or it's just a bunch of hype. Um, we're doing a classroom renovation. We just ripped out all our classes, and we're putting in all this technology, and we looked at wiring to the network. When I was at Oregon, we put wire to the desk like they have here. Well, at Stanford, we didn't. We did one classroom. Because we looked at the kinds of things the students were doing in class. They were doing research, going online, looking for things. And we didn't see any a need for a high data width, bandwidth, in the classroom at the time anyway. We may in the future. And we did make it possible to quickly wire them if we need to. Um, Lexis and Cisco are participating in another test. We'll have a three-year-long focus group with this entering class and six law firms who will look at wireless technology and how it's affecting the legal market and the legal education. Is wireless networking something we really want to do and, how is, and what does it do to our uh, business? Uh, all right. So with Nearspace, when we started with them, we developed an application with them, um, two applications. One was uh, www.nearspace.com. I'll try to do that over here if I can. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Oh, can I camera? Did that come up? Good. It's called Show image again. So this application was developed in, com in conjunction with the Nearspace and um, who else? Westlaw? Not Westlaw. Yeah, it was Westlaw too. And Palm. And what this allowed us to do was we had an uh, executive group that does training. We also have students who come in and admissions. And this is given to people when they go out for admissions because they, they want to contact faculty and stuff. So you click here. Ah. Can you see that? There you go. And up will come a list of faculty. You can do a search, too, but I'll just use one that's sitting there. So you go to Joseph Bankman, and you click on, oh, we'll go to, where's Bankman? There we go. Bankman. It's kind of hard to fill Bankman. And you can say, okay, let's look at Bankman. You're trying to go to, it's difficult to use. So there's his office at the law school. He's on the third floor, and it says exactly where it's located. But then you said, well, okay, but I need to contact him. And uh, this is difficult. There we go. And it gives you all his personal information. His room number, his phone number, everything you'd need to do to go ahead and set your meeting with him. And when you're done with that, you can click out, done. You can go ahead and, and that will transfer that information to your address book. So you don't have to relook that back up again. And then if you are trying to say, okay, I, I know where that is, but how do I get there from 101 and 280 and on the freeway? You can click. Blow it out to the campus map. And if you want to go out further, you can go to the larger campus map. And you can go all the way out, take you between 101 and 280, and it will take you right into the law school. So we have a lot of visitors that come uh, do training there, and they use it across campus. Some it also has information about all our rooms. So if you're coming there to do training, and you want to know if all this stuff is here so that you can do your presentation, you can go into this, click on the room, 
what's in the room, it tells you all the equipment that's in the room, and this is the room you need to schedule, and you can call facilities and schedule that room. It also has all the information that you'd need if you were coming to the law school and said, I need a fax machine, I need a telephone, I need to contact this person, I need admissions, I need all of those things. It's all in your palm, you don't need to go anywhere else. It's also, when you sync it and it's connected to the network or you use like a sawfish connection for IOR, IR, it'll update to the latest information that we have. That was one. And the other one we did, we worked with a company called Compass. And this company is kind of interesting. You can, uh, let me show later. You can contact them and they'll work with you as far as putting together this database for your students. So if you visit Stanford University and you're a student and you said, okay, I'm looking for a place for entertainment. And I'd like to go to nightlife, which is probably with, and I want to go to a bar or a club. And you click on any bar or club and up comes the information about that bar and club in the local area. And it also does everything for medical, healthcare, housing, everything you need to know. So in your palm, you've all of a sudden got all this information that's updated wirelessly, which we thought was a, a good use of the palm. And there's other softwares we run to. Is Elite is an online billing package we were having them testing. The Westlaw package, they've been trying that. And QuizApp is kind of interesting. If you haven't seen their stuff, they have an NPR review course, evidence cards on the Palm. Westlaw puts out about 13 doc, uh, books now on the Palm. And Adobe has a PDA reader that you can get on the Palm. Wordsmith is actually a word processing program that was written by a law student that graduated last year. And now he has his company. Um, the other thing we've been working on is trying to figure out, okay, we've... Oh, yeah, thanks. Computer, let me show me. We've been trying to figure out, I'm, well, we've been looking at it for two years as to how we're going to uh, get content to all the multiple devices off of our website. This is one way that everybody does it now. <coughs> if you want to provide XML, WML, all these other features and stuff, you have to create a separate website for each one of these provide content to them. So what we're trying to do, and we are, we're building this thing called the Content Transformation Engine with a couple of people. We've been working on it now. We were working on one group before, and now we're working on this for about six months. And what it does is it brings in any, it recognizes the device that's going to go to your website and cr creates content for that device for you, formatted in the way that you've defined. Um, so it, you can't, see con you can't see text and graphics on your cell phone because this actually gives uh, WAP content also. We can do that. Uh, it's an appliance. You plug it in and it automatically starts translating the information that you have available on your website into a format that you can read. But all, when you first do that, it's not as good. There's an engine that you have to use or a, uh, a console that you use. So it translates, uh, transforms all existing content to all devices. It delivers as an appliance. It's easy to use. Supposedly, not so easy so far. Then ask Brian. But in about um, probably a month to two or three months, this device will be available to everyone. The company that we were working with developing the product has been bought, and I can't tell you who they are, but they're going to buy them. You can probably tell by the color of the boxes who bought them. Um, so it's manageable, scalable. You can apply multiple devices. It doesn't run on layer seven. It's not software. It is. It's hardware. It actually uses a Linux kernel inside, but it allows you. Uh, to uh, expand if you need more of them, you just stack them on top of each other, keep on going. This is basically how it works. Comes in, it cleans up the data, turns it to X HTML, XSLT, which is a, a sort of an XML uh, format that allows you to, to convert XML into various forms of other XML. And then it moves it out over to the engine. It even handles S uh, secure transactions too. It takes care of all of that in the CTE. Allows you to do portals, renderings, and it, to all of these different devices in the CTE Design Studio, lets you set rules for your website so that you don't have to sit there and, and build the website the way you want. You can set rules, and your website conforms to those rules, and then only delivers that content to the specific devices. These are the kinds of things on the left that it will solve: internet service, extranet. We tried the mail service, and that needs to be tweaked to be able to handle mail effectively, although the web mail stuff that we use on campus works quite well. You can put server load balancers between these and stuff. We're not doing it. We're going right, right below. We run straight through it to the phones, to the palms, to wherever we want. Um, different configuration options. Still, we're doing the same thing. We go directly through it. 
It's a public external content. You have three different ways you can do your internet, extranet, intranet. Depending on how you want to secure it, you can run a VPN through it and stuff if you need to. So quickly, it allows you to wirelessly enable your, your uh, websites. You can provide many the, the, the content to these devices. And, and to tell you the truth, we haven't even decided what content we need to put to these devices, but before we do it, we have to get some kind of content to the devices to see if it's valuable. And uh, since we have all these people that are willing to fund this and try out these things and use our students somewhat as guinea pigs, uh, we're willing to uh, go ahead. And we also seem to think that there is some value to this because the students place value even in the palms that we have in the field right now. And it keeps us from having to do the website redesign. We were thinking of building websites based on the Palm, based on the, the uh, wireless handhelds. We didn't want to do that. This is basically the CTE Design Studio, standard rules-based stuff, allows you to edit views, do your XML trees, clean up the information without showing you how the thing works. Um, it'd be difficult to say how easy it works, except Ryan would know. Ryan, how easy is this tool? Basically, you look at your page and then you click on different elements, like there's images, we have a header at the top of all our pages, you just click on it, it highlights that uh, level of, in the tree and you can decide to flip it or modify it. If you have certain text that you know you explained out this long acronym, you could modify it so that you just put in the acronym so that would show up in your wireless thing, because obviously you're not going to scroll for, you know, Right. Pages to look at the URL or whatever. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we'll do right away is the more button on your phone, if you've ever used that, it automatically does that for you. You don't have to insert that anyway. So even if you have some text you do want to see on the phone. Uh, these are the, um, when you want to transfer them to prompt, basically, let me see those content, add page, prompt, page. This is, the, uh, this is just the unit. I haven't used this, so I don't really know this piece right here that well. So the, the secure part of the thing is that we were looking at ways of providing, providing information to the phones and to the PDAs and stuff in a secure format. And we didn't want it. We have a lot of information that um, people soft we want students to get access to. And so we go through this device. It provides all our security. Everything's secure as it goes through. And we can go on with that. Just run, blah, blah, blah. Java doesn't run yet. They're, they're looking at ways of making Java run within the engine and then it executes a screen to the, to the PDA or the phone or whatever device, including an IP telephony project we're running. All the screens for the IP telephony project are running through this device. So what we're looking for is a way of having a complete connection on every single device, on any kind of information we have available to everyone. And I'll let you know next year if we were successful because a lot of this is all just out there trying to get things done and everything is depending on various projects finishing. And I'll have uh, statistical information on the POM, on the WAP, and all that stuff next year. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Did whoever's putting in these transceivers wire like the entire place, basically, so the entire school is wired? No, well, our whole school is wired. We have almost 25 or more access points. And we actually, as the students use the wireless, they can go into an area that doesn't have wireless. We just, oh, okay, we'll put one over there, too. We just so add them. Just also specific for the entire University? University? No, it's not yet, but it's working towards that. The um, law school and the engineering school are the only two that are wireless. But we're working on a campus initiative to, wire, to create the whole uh, university as wireless. And what we do is if our students go over to the library or they go over to Preston or some lounge, we, they come to us and they say, well, I'm all, we're always over here. And if we get 10 or 15 of them saying, the cost is so little, $1,000, we just go over and put another access point over there. And in reality, we put maybe three or four or five and they're happy. I know that you're Mm -hmm. 10, right. Probably there. And I know the wireless cars are only connecting maybe 
11, Ryan. Do the students complain about the speed? No, we actually provide digital television over our, our uh, network. And they, ha they can access that on the wireless card. If we had a whole classroom of people go up and want to watch the digital television, we'd have a problem. But it, um, on a one-to-one, two-to-one, three-to-one basis, we can feed that kind of data to them. And more often than not, they're doing research, web work, things like that. No, they're not complaining about students. Like they like the availability more than anything else. And one thing we've noticed is we, students start working in groups. Well, those groups focus around printers. Printers seem to be the decision maker as to where they go to work. And so we're adding, we're, instead of adding network jacks, we're adding printers at various locations. We're tricking out areas that you wouldn't think that would be a place, a student lounge. We, went, we just went ahead and put a screen in, projectors, all kinds of stuff, and they have wireless access, and we're adding Westlaw printers and Lexus printers, and all of a sudden that space we're looking at as a, as a more usable space in the library. We're actually thinking of separating the library from the technology as far as the computers and stuff. One, we're using all laptops. We have a laptop requirement. We've had it for about three years. We're going to go ahead and probably initiate that much stronger and remove a lot of the computers out of labs and provide a better infrastructure for using the laptops. Gary, and with you guys, you said you have a laptop requirement, but the students aren't required to have wireless cards? No. I just tried to provide enough services to make it better. So then what do they use in the laptop for as far as the requirements? Is it? Oh, I mean, what was the, what guys, and I'll, I'll examine, check on that book. Okay, so, so then they're putting to their digital printers. Yeah, at home, and we, and we still provide some okay. computers for printing. Okay. But it's a lot, as you said, it's a lot easier. I, I'd rather support the model that says you go where you want to go, and I'll follow with the equipment. And our faculty, the same way, the ones that are using laptops, and most of them are, they go home, and they're using their laptop, they close the lid, they can just put it to sleep, they can come to the law school, they turn it on, they can use it without ever having to worry about calling somebody. Hmm? When you do a presentation, you just plug it in, you don't have to worry about what I'm providing. Right. Word 2000 versus Word 97. You just skip the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yes? What kind of support do you provide to students for laptops? We've seen um, the business school, the University of Texas, provides an incredible support mm -hmm. to student laptops. We really don't want to get in that business, so that's why we have a required laptop. Well, when you do require, require them, you do sort of buy into uh, supporting them. And what we do is we uh, require a specific laptop, or at least two, three altogether. We have an HP, an IBM, and an Apple. And if they buy any of those three, we provide a much higher level support. If they choose to come with something else or uh, buy something else, then we uh, provide a different level of support. There's no loaners available if you haven't bought the existing laptop. The repair sequence will take a lot longer or not at all. They'll have to deal with it themselves. And we, we get a pretty good group of students now that buy the laptop we recommend. And I negotiate almost nine months on the price of that laptop. Yeah, we do. You don't have a requirement at a particular time. Do you provide a lot of support? No. Right now, or you just... No, I tell them they need to have a reliable notebook. With I, would, I give them recommendations for the next business day, on-site service, but they need to go in and take an exam for three hours and feel like they've got a good notebook. We even do a sort of a triage prior to exams. All our exams are on laptops, too. You guys probably do that already. And what we do is students who are having problems with their laptops, they come in for about two weeks prior to the exam, and somebody will go over their laptop and clean it up or rebuild it for them. And that's your staff? Yes. And they have, we have, what, nine to five? Five to nine. And nine Virginia, to five, yeah. In Virginia, y'all don't do that? No, I give them the same notice. You know, if you're having problems or a vendor's really not treating you well, you get the notice. Because when we've talked to, to Dell about, you know, we've had a drop place. They buy the, the three-year warranty and they tell now we work on them. I was gonna say I, I, I have you know 330 kids coming in. Some have a good one year old notebook, and I'm not gonna make them buy it. So then they kind of get stuck if they want to go one year into it. But I also have, I mean, on the Dell side, there's always the consumer line or the business line. And for some of them, the price point, you know, is they want the DVD and all the things that are not necessary to go to law school, and they're not gonna pay for it. And, and I guess I just haven't gotten in the business of telling them exactly what they want. I, 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 I tell every one of them, I'll talk to them before they come in, and then give them a call. I actually found the students wanted somebody to tell them what to buy. Because they feel they're out there, they've got all these systems out there. Which one do I buy? Somebody make the decision for me. That's not all of them. The ones that are going to buy the system on their own, they have a good idea of what they want. They but I'm buy even a better machine than what you're recommending. 
Right, right. And the machine we've recommended has been tested. We, we get them used three months ahead of time. We go ahead and run them through some tests. We actually usually use a faculty, give it to the faculty, say what they, see if they like it, if they don't like it, how do they use it. I think ours, the other one we were using this year for HP went to Japan and he used it all over Japan. And he was very happy with it. It didn't break down. And, and IBM has consistently given us good laptops. Apple has. And HP we picked up last year because they wanted to be part of the project. And we've tested their laptops and they've been effective also. And then there's support changes too. When you've got a bunch of students all using the same laptop, when you make a phone call to IBM and say, look, you need to resolve this, IBM or HP's response to that is they ship me a new laptop and I give it to the student. And you can do that as a law school. We found that they're not as responsive to us as to those. Then we don't require them. So right. They're very responsive. They're very helpful. Right. Mm -hmm. They've worked with us a lot. Yes. We're on the, uh, the edge of going wireless, except uh, administration has been hung up for a while now with the, the 802.11.8 or something. Is it senseless to think about installing the 802.11.8 right now? Or well, if you look at the cost, you could have both. So the, if you try, I mean, at, at Stanford, the cost of one TSO is $1,000. When I was going to do all the classes, it was about 1,500 TSOs. And I looked at 50,000 or? 150,000. And I said, well, let's go with this. And when I want to add eight, another 50,000, I'm still up above 50,000. And I have twice the network. And the two don't conflict with each other. And if you want to pull B, that's fine. But I think we'll have some residuals because all those students will have B cards. So you can run both. Right. And if you don't have a pressing need for the extra speed, right. I don't know if there's anything really wait. Yes. Uh, just to cover what you just said, um, we're doing it also on the symbol, and in our agreement, they will upgrade uh, the access points. Symbol has the upgrades, right? Their right. access yeah, points upgrade. Of, you, you, with symbol, you have the option of not just buying all the hardware out, but you can in fact lease it. And part of the lease will be they'll upgrade it not in one shot, but over time. Uh, so you know, that's an option. Sam, for the first time I've been taught, listening to you talk, I've heard people talk about doing this for students as convenience as a vehicle communication, whereas in the past it's always been about what are the pedagogical benefits of mm -hmm. um, having it. So uh, my question is how are faculty or are faculty using it in the classroom? Do they care about it or is it just there so the student can sit No, the students have laptops. And, and with with that, wireless, instead of going in and claim, you know they need somebody to come in to connect their laptop. Well, their laptop's already connected. When they want to get on the internet, they connect the projector. How are the faculty using, or, or is the faculty taking advantage of this change where they're teaching the classroom? Yes. Uh, they are. Right. And, and they're working with people. I mean, some of the people, Brian's been one of them. I told them we had a, I was, a strategic planning group as to how we were going to address pedagogy in the classrooms. And one of the faculty stood up and said, somebody would have to marry me, carry me over the threshold, and then spend the rest of their life with me showing me how to use it. So I asked Ryan and one of the other people to, to marry me. <laughs> and they did. And uh, the result of that was quite good. He integrated a lot of that technology. He ended up putting up all kinds of materials. He ended up having his class recorded and putting that up. And then he ended up doing a lot of that himself. He said it was easier for him to put the information up after he learned how than it was for Ryan and Kat to do that for him. Did, wasn't that right? He yeah. said using Dreamweaver was as simple as Microsoft Word. Right. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Simple edits. My question is on the same line as hers. We are currently uh, integrating wireless in our law school. And what I'm facing against is faculty being very reluctant to allow laptops into the classroom because they are very fearful of students browsing the web, checking email. If they're not, yeah, they're browsing the web, checking email, they're playing solitaire or some other game. I mean, there's, you can do all of that. And what we're going to do is we're just going to, I mean, the wireless access points, there's a few of them. You can control that by power or port on your switch, and you can just turn them off. All right, we are about that recently. Right, exactly. Right. It is distracting somewhat when somebody's sitting over there typing crazily and you're, you're barely talking. But uh, <laughs> and I, I have some professors that said, you know, I just want to have a switch right here so I can press it and watch everyone. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's what we use, Mac-based security. You have to enter each message address. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh, for each card. That's pretty much the security we run across 
the network, even for our desktops. Our desktops are DHCP, but they're all MAC addressed. Did you do that? Was that homegrown product that you purchased? This is Stanford product. Didn't we do it? That was developed at Stanford, wasn't it, Steve? Yeah. Any other questions? Another good thing that oh. we're doing, everything's wired. I'm at the University of Richmond, and all of our classrooms wired, all the carols are wired. But the new courtroom wasn't, for obvious reasons. We didn't want to run wires in that beautiful room, so we put a wireless network in that. And so um, that room, I think, has two transceivers. And like they said, it'll go out so many feet, and it's wonderful because it goes outside. And our, we have required wireless cars, but we have 40 of them that our students will only check out mm -hmm. at the surf desk. And they've all got the software. We put the software onto their laptops. They just need to plug it in. And ready to go. Do you have any statistical information as to how many times those cards are checked out? Or Not much, yes. How much yet, yeah. Part of that is getting faculty to use it. So we mm -hmm. talked to faculty and big guinea pigs and holding their classes in that classroom. And we sat in there, watched the transceivers and monitored to make sure that both were getting even the kids and things like that to make sure that the technology was working right. And more and more students are wanting to use it. In fact, our um, Westlaw rep, student rep, was doing some kind of promotional thing he checked out three or four of our laptops and put it in the lobby, checked out wireless cards so the students could do whatever they wanted to do online. Mm -hmm. So the students were actually figuring out mm -hmm. better ways to use the technology than that we are right now. And we have students showing up with iPacks. It was pretty cheap to put it in. That have the 802.11b connections on the back and they're sitting there, how do I hook up this thing? <laughs> 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 so that's been good. Well, anyway, thank you. Thank you.